Okay. The wrong announcement. So the the dinner and the music tonight is on the Adriatico Terrace, uh, and it starts at uh, seven thirty. Everybody is welcome. It's uh, ten euros also, and uh, it it will go independent of the weather. If it is if, if it rains, it will be inside, but most likely it will be on uh, on the terrace. Not, uh, on the, uh, oh no! It's okay. okay. So. We have the second lectures on ionization. Ah, oh, it's fine. It's, it's fine. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Now it disappeared. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now yeah. Okay. Should I start? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. We'll come back to the second uh, lecture. Yesterday I stopped, uh, uh, I'm still talking about probes of ionization, and this will be the theme most of, the, most of the, this, this talk and, and, and tomorrow. Uh, so, so last time I talked about the CMB as the probe, and it gives us this integral constraint. Today I'll continue with that line. There's lots of new data. I will not go through the details of everything, because there's really lots of new data. Um, uh, but I'll give you a flavor of the other things. So the CMB was one of the big constraints, which unfortunately became weaker and weaker with time, uh, as I mentioned uh, yesterday. Uh, today I'll talk about something that has become stronger and stronger in time, which is the Lyman Alpha Forest. Um, and uh, this is, uh, I, I'm not sure how many of you, have, you know what is the Lyman Alpha Forest, because you have very different backgrounds. So, so when you look at quasars at very high redshifts, quasars are, uh, unlike stars, stars emit in, in kind of thermal radiation. Quasars are more, uh, more uh, uh, power low type of radiation because the, the source of energy is different. It comes from the accretion disk and, and it has a normally kind of a power low uh, uh, dependence on energy. So it emits in continuum and it has this, uh, this uh, uh, typical, uh, typical uh, shape. And normally it looks like uh, you will see it anyway, but this is a quasar, and the, 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 way we the, the way we look at it, you'll see it in data in, in, in a minute, if you have very high resolution spectrum, and this is one of these kind of, uh, uh, in the last 20 years, it became very, very, this is the advent of eight and 10 meter telescopes that, that made this, uh, this stuff possible. It's a huge, it's a very kind of exciting field. It has been for a while. Uh, where you look at a quasar and you look at the spectrum, and the spectrum has all kinds of features. Some of it has to do with the emission of the, of, from the quasar itself, but the other things have to do with how, this, how the energy that is emitted by this quasar is absorbed uh, in the intervening intergalactic medium. And, uh, and uh, uh, th this has a long history. It started 65, I think, with the, with the first predictions by Gunn and Peterson. And, uh, uh, but, uh, uh, and, 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 and it, was, it was seen, and, and there, there was people all, you know, kind of uh, uh, proposing all kinds of mechanisms why we see this absorption from sm small halos to other things. Now, nowadays, we understand this absorption. It's basically the diffuse intergalactic medium, basically the elementary structure and, and, and large-scale structure in the universe, where you have a little bit over densities of, uh, of baryons, uh, and that kind of absorbs some of the emitted trans uh, energy. Uh, and and uh, uh, the optical depth for, uh, for absorption is basically this. It's basically the number density of hydrogen, neutral hydrogen, because that's when the absorption, it, it's done on Lyman alpha, so that's, that it depends on the neutral hydrogen. Sigma is your uh, op, uh, cross section, which is a standard number, uh, and dx is the line of sight. You will see it in different version in a minute, but divided by one plus z because there is a redshift as, as it comes. So, when an energy comes out of the quasar, as it goes to us, it redshifts, and then the, the resonant energy of Lyman alpha, not, in other words, the Lyman alpha. Emission or, or um, uh, absorption uh, in that redshift kind of redshifts a little bit. So you see that there is absorption at different parts of the uh, of the quasar. Okay, and from this we learn a lot. Apparently, this has been a so this is a typical quasar. Uh, uh, this is not very high uh, 
high redshift quasar. Uh, you will you will see it. In a, you'll see why in a minute. Uh, I mean, immediately you see that there's lots of noise here, uh, and and when you see something like this, you immediately think either this is very high redshift that is very hard to see, or it's very low redshift. And the reason it's very low redshift uh, because we cannot see this from the ground if it's very low redshift. This is HST. And the HST doesn't have a big mirror, doesn't, have, doesn't spend too, too much time on it. But any, anyways, it shows the features. You will see other spectra in a, in a minute. Uh, and normally, this is a typical uh, kind of spectrum. You see uh, this very prominent feature. That's the Lyman alpha emission at the quasar redshift. This is the, the thing that comes out of the, redshift, the quasar itself. Red words of it, this is angstroms, so that's longer wavelength. Red word of it, you will see uh, not so much structure. It's kind of basically a bit of uh, uh, emission lines, mostly from metals in that system. And, and uh, uh, blue words of it, at, at smaller redshifts, uh, you will see that the spectrum here gets absorbed at many places. Uh, so most of these absorption are, are not noise. This is noise, but those big ones are not noise. And there's lots of things that you can learn from this. I'll show you another spectrum in a second with a movie. Uh, they have different names, these absorption features, depending on what their strength and all of that stuff. Uh, so, uh, so most of these features are called the forest line. This is Laman Alpha Forest. When you have something so deep, it calls Laman Alpha System. Uh, and uh, there's here, uh, 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 th these are uh, DLAs, uh, uh, well, the time time analysis, there's a break and there's the limit. Anyways, and there's uh, three classifications for this absorption because this absorption tell us something about the intensity, the column density, how much uh, along the line of sight, how much the integral of density integrated along the line of sight of that system you see. So things that have high column densities like this, they are called damped line analysis systems. These are intermediate, they are called Lyman limit systems, and the very weakest ones, the thinnest ones, they, have, uh, they are called uh, forest lines, basically Lyman alpha forest. And the, 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 the nature of these things is a bit different. If you look at the damned Lyman alpha system, I'll show, I'll show you to you here. So this is a movie that was, uh, you will see the credit at the end of the movie. So what you will see in this movie is a quasar. The quasar is here. And this is the radiation that comes out of the quasar. And you will follow the radiation as it comes to us. So as this radiation comes to us, all of these features will experience redshift. They will redshift a little bit. So the, 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 the spectrum, you will see it shifting. And then when it hits this radiation, for instance, it hits this cloud, uh, it will be absorbed at the local uh, resonant line, which is the Lyman alpha at that redshift. So it will absorb different parts of the, of the feature. And you will see when you hit something like a galaxy, you will see much deeper uh, absorption because the density is much higher, the column density is much higher, etc. Clearly, because when, you, when these things absorb, they are in the intergalactic medium, you learn about the intergalactic medium. Okay? So let me, let's run the movie. It's kind of a very educational movie. It's made by one of the students of Martin Hainhild. I have to give the credit to Martin. Ah, this is challenging. Right. The thing is that it's very tiny on my screen, so it's very hard. Oh, God. <laughs> Come on. Okay. Okay. Oh, right. It works. So uh, I, I'll stop it. Go back. <laughs> we'll see. It will work eventually. Yeah. So. You see that this radiation, uh, first of all, you see that this is shifting to the left, right? Uh, so, uh, to the left or the, yeah, no, to the right. And, and as it, it shifts, so it, it, uh, it uh, passed this cloud, and this cloud has this very strong absorption. This stuff doesn't get absorbed by Lamin Alpha because it was ne it's never in resonance with Lamin Alpha. It's always higher energy than Lamin Alpha, okay? So that's, that's uh, something that, uh, uh, sorry, lower energy than, than Lamin Alpha, so it's never in resonance. Okay, so we'll go, we'll continue, and you'll see that this, this is how the forest is built up. Now, you, you see another thing here, you see there? This is the Lyman Alpha, this will be the Lyman Beta, because Lyman Beta is also having, uh, but it's weaker, and this is the Lyman Gamma, etc. and until you get to hit this, this thing, which is the Lyman Limit, that's where things break, right? There's, I mean, it's basically ionized. And so we continue. Now you will see a big thing coming, like a galaxy, in a second. 
Yeah, there it is, and you'll see the feature that will come there. Right. And uh, you see this feature. This is the Amplar Malaba system. That's because we are passing through galaxies. So these systems are less abundant. They, they are less kind of uh, there. But they teach us about high density features like galaxies. Um, and, and you can notice if you, do you remember the void profile? Have any of you know what the void profile is? No. OK. So I'll, I'll, well, if you know, you know. But many people, I, I guess, don't know. So this, the, the, the shape of the line is determined by a number of things. In quantum physics, normally, the shape of the line is defined by a number of things. One of them, uh, there, is, there are a couple of things that produce things like velocity dispersion. For example, if you have gas that has lots of velocities, it produces Gaussian type of absorption. right? So the line should be Gaussian. Uh, but another, another effect, for instance, the finite lifetime of the transition will create a Lorentzian. Right? That's also turbulence created through Lorentzian whereas velocities and temperature create Gaussians. So normally, the, f the shape of the line is a convolution between these Gaussians and these Lorentzians. And uh, in the very strong lines, the Lorentzian part dominates. In the very weak parts, the Gaussian part dominates. So these are very well described by Gaussian features, whereas the strong one is Lorentzian. It has nothing to do with column density, the shape of the Lorentzian. It's basically the quantum effect. It's the, it's the shape of the line. It's just the fact that you have lots of these types of things. Anyways, so we continue. And, uh, and then you ca can see all kinds of things. Here there are absorptions that you've seen. So these are metal lines in emission, but these are absorptions due to metal lines. So if you have metals in the intergalactic medium, you, which have different absorption features than, the, than the, 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 the Lyman alpha, you see them mostly here. Of course, they will appear also here, but they will be, their number will be very small. So this is dominated by Lyman alpha. And you can see that this division between Lyman alpha and Lyman beta, it will be blurred in a second, because these things which, were, which are Lyman beta will go into the region where Lyman alpha is. So there will be a mixture of things. OK? And this is what you normally see. So in, in very, if you have a very good telescope, like, uh, like KEK or, or the, the, the VLT, and you have spectra for three nights, this takes a long time. Uh, you look at a spectrum of a quasar at Richard 3, it takes a long time to get very high resolution spectra. You, you see something like this, right? Now, the thing that is at the top, this, this red line, which kind of covers everything, that's called the continuum. This is the really intrinsic property of the quasar, whereas the, re uh, the rest of the absorption feature have to do with the intergalactic medium. This is how we learn about the intergalactic medium. OK? That's fine? Good. So now, oh, now we go ahead. So this is a, a real spectrum, but this is not a, a, an HST spectrum. This is a Keck spectrum. Uh, this is one of the, uh, sorry, there are two spectra here. I'm sorry. There are two spectra. One is an HST spectrum. You see the redshift. The redshift is very small. At these windows, we cannot see from the atmosphere is a problem. We cannot see from the atmosphere. We have to go up. And this is at redshift 3. This is one of the best quasars that were studied. These are, this is not noise. You can resolve these things. I mean, nowadays, we see them in details of details. They are just look so crammed because, because there are so many of them. Uh, and you can see that the main features of the continuum this stuff like this, and, and here there's another, they are kind of very similar. Uh, you can see two things that, that, uh, that, that uh, first of all, that they are very similar in continuum, as I mentioned. Of course, they are different redshifts, but they are shifted to the rest frame of both. So they, they look exactly the same. Uh, but one thing that you can see that the number of absorption features here is much, much smaller than here. Do you know why? This is the expansion of the universe. This is the expansion of the universe. Anybody that doubts the expansion of the universe, here it is. The universe is much less denser at redshift 0.15 than it is at redshift 3. It's actually less denser by 30 times almost. <laughs> right? So that's, that's, that's uh, anyone you know, can doubt the universe expands? You know, <laughs> this is one of the nice ways to see it. Um, and as you can see, red words of, the, of this Lyman alpha, inter, the intrinsic Lyman alpha emission 
there are not so many things, but they are very useful stuff because you can learn about, for instance, if this is you, you identify this as a certain uh, uh, line, uh, that, as a certain uh, metal, you can from it use things to say what's the temperature around that quasar, what's its redshift, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then you study these, these features. Now let, let me go through this, uh, this formula. I, I, I showed a, a similar formula before, uh, a sim similar formula to this, uh, a number of formulae here. First of, uh, first of all, you, uh, the, the cross section is, uh, has to do with a number of things. So the resonance line, the frequency is the original frequency shifted by one plus z, depending on the redshift at which this is absorbed. And there's also a peculiar velocity effect. Right, because that's where things uh, happen. Uh, now, uh, if you substitute this here, this is what you will get. It's the same formula that you got before, uh, this one, but now I put it in a really kind of the, the, the proper way, where this is the line element it re represented in terms of, this is CDT basically, but you take uh, Barbara's book and, and look at what, how, how, how Z, you know, DZDT looks like from Hubble law. Uh, from Friedman equation and pl shove it in, the, you know, plug it in the formula. This is what you get. Uh, so all of this is basically CDT, and uh, this is again the same, the same thing. And uh, you can see that this this tau, this this uh, uh, optical depth, is very sensitive to how the number density of neutral hydrogen. The fact that we see this stuff tells us that the neutral hydrogen fraction is of the order 10 to the minus 4. This fact that we see this means that the universe is ionized. Because if there were more neutral hydrogen than this ratio, uh, well, this is another one. This is, this is one of the most, this is kind of the, the same one in more detail. Uh, so if there were more uh, neutral hydrogen in the intergalactic medium, this is what you will see. Nothing. Because there's lots of hydrogen in the universe. And it will absorb everything if it was neutral. But it's not. So this is our main, main uh, evidence now with hundreds of those systems, if not thousands of those systems, that the universe is ionized at low redshifts. Right? So in the previous talk, I told you the CMB talk teaches us that the universe became neutral at some stage. This shows us that the universe became, uh, you know, Ionized at some stage, so there must have been an epoch of reionization. Okay, so this is the evidence. Now, what I showed you before was redshift three. This is a very uh, kind of famous figure, famous plot. Uh, this is one of the highlights of Sloan. To my mind, this is probably the most important result of Sloan. But yeah, that's debatable. But it's one of the most important, if not the most important. Uh, this is from a series of papers uh, from Fan et al. The, the, that's 2003-2006. This is the 2006 compilation. What you see here is a compilation of all the high redshift quasars that Sloan have seen. I think they are 19 or something like this in number. And you see in all of them the same kind of thing. This is the Lyman alpha emission. And then you see these are absorptions. Uh, now, why you see this like this? This is the same spectrum I mentioned as here. So there's an effect that I forgot to mention, which is very important. Uh, let me go here. At low redshifts, these absorption features are very far, to, far apart, right? If you go to higher redshift, like we see here, they become very close. Let's imagine now we go a little bit higher. What will happen, there will be, these lines will be crowded. So if you had at low redshift lines like that looked like this, these are Gaussians in my hand, so this, <laughs> I cannot do better than this for a Gaussian. Uh, this is low redshift. At high redshift, they will get closer and closer. So this, there will be something at redshift three, there will be something like this. But at higher redshift, what will happen is that the first line, which looked like this, will basically enter to the second line, which looked like this. So what you will see, is that they are two lines in one. Yeah, that's called crowding. Now, now this is with two lines. Imagine you have many of those. So what you will see in, 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 in practice is a lot of wobble here, which has to do with the tips of the lines. And it look like emission lines. They're not emission lines. They're absorption features that are mixed together. 
right? And this is exactly what you are seeing here, right? This is the same Lyman alpha emission, but this is, the, this is where these features are. Now, these, this figure, in this figure, the quasars are ordered in such a way that the lowest one is the lowest redshift, but this is very high redshift. This is redshift 5.74, right? And you can see that we go to higher and higher redshifts. How we know that? From the position of the Lyman alpha emission, Lyman alpha feature. It goes in that direction. It means it's higher redshift. Now, if you look at those ones at low redshifts, you see this one. It has lots of wobbles here. So it means that you have lots of this stuff, right? But if you go up and up and up, you see, for instance, this one. There is nothing. It's completely wiped. And that was a surprise. Because you would expect that this will evolve slowly, these things, these features will become weaker and weaker and weaker, but you don't expect them to be suddenly like this. So something has changed at higher redshifts. At around redshift six, six point something, something changes. And, and this is uh, expressed in the, on another famous plot from the same series of papers. Uh, uh, where this is again from uh, 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 from um, Fan et al. 2006, where you can calculate from the shape of the line, the width, the optical depth for these lines, the effective optical depth, because you have to stack, stack a lot of things, and and this is how it looks like. So it's you know very highly. So this is the GP stands for Gunn Peterson. This is this is the name of the effect. And this is how this tau evolves as a function of redshift, from low redshift quasars to a higher redshift quasars, from redshift three, a bit by bit, it, it rises and rises. And if nothing happens in the universe, it just have the same kind of features, it will follow this dashed line. But at redshift six, you see that this optical depth for absorption becomes much higher. And this is a sign that you have more neutral fraction in the universe at these redshifts. So this is the tail of the reionization period. Now, is this significant to tell us when reionization happens? No. The reason is very simple. At these regions, the ionized fraction or neutral fraction, uh, the neutral fraction, is of the order 10 to the minus 4. 1 in 10,000 even less of particles are neutral. It's enough to do one, one order of magnitude more. Instead of having 1 in 10,000 neutral, you can have 1 in 1,000 neutral, and you will recover this effect. It's still a very highly ionized universe, but it's less ionized by a little bit. When it did most of the ionization, we don't know from this figure. This is the tail. So all what we can learn from this is that, that the tail of ionization, ionization happens somewhere, and we are seeing just the end of it around 36. Okay, so that's uh, uh, that's that. Now, in the last uh, in the last, uh, you know, this is 2006. Now it's a decade, uh, ten years exactly, and uh, there's lots of other observations. And the people have been adding higher redshift and higher redshift quasars. This guy has the record. This is 7.085. We have another. Couple of them a bit lower than seven. There's another one from you kids. This is from, uh, 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 I think this is from you kids, actually. This is from you kids. There's another one from Vista, I think, that's a bit, a bit lower. Uh, this is a paper by Mortlach et al. from 2011, and it sees this quasar. Uh, again, he, they, they put it in a very unusual way. Be relative to what we have seen, but this is the limit of their, uh, of their observation. You see the Lyman alpha feature. This is the stuff red words of the Lyman alpha, and this is the stuff blue words of the Lyman alpha. So this will be the Lyman alpha forest in principle, and this will be the things that do not get attenuated too much. And uh, see, this is silicon, carbon, all of these lines, and we use them actually to get all kinds of information about temperature and things like that. Uh, uh, and this is where the Lyman alpha and Lyman beta starts. There are lots of things were done here, and, uh, uh, and there's lots of studies. And you can see people go into this, this, this kind of, to this region. So this region is the region where you move from.
from uh, where the ionization or the neutral IgM or the IgM in general, how much it is, we don't know, neutral it is, we don't know, uh, is clear. So this is blowing up this. Uh, there are a number of, uh, fig uh, of, of lines here. Look at the black line. This is the black line. The black line is this very high redshift quasar. The other two lines are two different quasars that are also very high redshift. This is 6.4 and 6.5, I think. They are very high redshift quasars. And you can see that the transition from the Lyman alpha to the forest, where the forest should be, is much, much sharper in this high redshift one. Right? So this is, a, this is a, an evidence for, uh, for more neutral stuff. Turns out, no. Right? So the, the more sharp you are, the more absorption you have, because it suddenly gets absorbed. Turns out that this stuff is, is ionizing itself. So you are not seeing the ionization of the, of the whole universe. You are seeing the, the, the quasar cleaning up its surrounding, basically. And so this is, uh, this is, uh, uh, this is uh, we don't learn much from this, uh, from this quasar, unfortunately, although it's such a high redshift about reionization, we learn about the, the, the quasar itself. And it turns out that this quasar specifically is very new. Its lifetime is probably of the order of, uh, I don't know, a few, few million years, uh, 0.1 or 2 million years. Normally, the duty cycle of a quasar is about 10 million years. Quasars shine, get, get very active 10 million years, and they are shut down for 90. Well, these are the average number, of course. Every quasar is different, and they shut down for 100 years. That's called uh, the duty cycle. Yeah, and uh, so this is, uh, uh, has been newly turned on. The quasar in our galaxy is dormant, right? But it will be active at some stage, I guess, and, and that's hopefully not in our lifetime, but, uh, but it will be active at some stage. Okay, so from these things you can learn a lot, but not as much as you have hoped. Um, uh, but still, people are really, really going after these things, and, uh, and uh, their interpretation is very interesting and exciting, and tell us about the quasars themselves, themselves uh, and about the intergalactic medium. Uh, okay, next. There's uh, uh, more questions about this before I stop. Yes, please. And redshift? Uh, yeah, it, it depends. Yeah, it depends when ionization happens. Uh, so the question is how far you can, deep you can go in, in, in terms of redshift and quasars. Uh, I mean, the, the question implies the following. If you have neutral intergalactic media and you have a quasar, all of its radiation, blue words of the Lyman alpha line, will get absorbed completely. So you will not see it. Uh, it will be, be much harder to see it. Uh, so that depends when ionization happened. And uh, in seven, you still have something, but it's not clear whether this implies that ionization happened already or that you have neutral stuff. It, it's not clear. Yeah, yeah, you can, of course. Of course you can. There's no problem. Uh, actually, we hope that we have some of those for the 21 centimeter, but, uh, but then they have to be radio loud. That's a, a completely different story. But you can, right? Uh, so the, initially, people hoped from this sudden drop to say that, oh, this is the, ionized, the, neutral, the neutral intergalactic medium is cleaning everything up. But it turns out that this quasar is new, and uh, it hasn't, uh, so it might be its, its, own, uh, its own influence. The, this figure, which I don't want to explain, forget about this figure, it, says, it basically says when a quasar, after how, many, how much time the quasar uh, lifetime or activity will stop being uh, relevant. So for certain, for certain uh, uh, neutral fraction around it, for instance, this line after 0.1 million years of it being active, its activity doesn't matter anymore. And this is for, uh, for uh, uh, neutral fraction of one. It actually takes much more time to discern the, uh, the quasar activity from the intergalactic medium uh, kind of state. OK, so now I'll go to another one of these also surprises. Uh, in the last couple of, uh, yeah, one and a half decades, I think, now. They, they are called Lyman alpha emitters. These are galaxies. Uh, that you don't see them around us, but at high redshifts, you suddenly start seeing them. Uh, the, so these are high redshift galaxies, but they have very high fraction of their emission in Lyman alpha. Right? That's why they are called Lyman alpha emitters. Uh, uh, so they are uh, relatively dust-free. 
Uh, they are selected through uh, narrowband filters. So in, in, when you do imaging, you have filters to, to do colors. And if you have lots of narrowband filters, you can pick them up at high redshifts. The best telescope for this is Subaru, so it turns out to be. But there are many other telescopes that have been doing, uh, at least, uh, I mean, in terms of the initial discovery, Subaru was, was fantastic. And it's still a fantastic instrument. They have a new uh, camera on it called Hyper Supreme or Hyper Supreme, depends which side of the of the ocean you are, uh, uh, but, and, and it's kind of producing a lot of these, uh, these data. Uh, uh, so again, the argument here why they are useful for us for uh, probing reionization, if you have emission in Lyman alpha, and this Lyman alpha is at high redshift, as it progresses, it redshifts towards, uh, towards smaller uh, uh, kind of uh, frequencies a little bit, and if you happen to have neutral hydrogen around it, the neutral hydrogen will absorb it, and you will not see it. So you can follow these objects at high redshifts, and you see when they kind of disappear, and I'll come to that in a second. Uh, uh, and so, so the, I mean, these are objects that are interesting in their own right. Uh, we think they are uh, low-mass halos of 10 to the 11, 10 to the 10 solar masses, uh, and this has been a, a huge kind of field in the last uh, few years. And, and, uh, and I'll quote a very kind of classic paper by McQuinn, I think it's part of, part of his PhD, uh, where he kind of asked, what can we learn from these Lyman alpha emitters about reionization? And he had three scenarios. Uh, the, f the above ones are simulations of the universe, uh, of, the, of the ionization level of H1 in the universe, basically. So, here you have, uh, you have ionized stuff, and the black is the, new, uh, the neutral stuff. Uh, so it's the opposite, basically. White is ionized, and black is, 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 is neutral. And these are three simulations at certain redshift, where here you have the ionized fraction is 30%. So out of every 100 uh, hydrogen uh, atoms, uh, 30 are ionized, right? So that's what it means. Here it's 50% and here 70%, right? So this is highly ionized, this is a little bit ionized. And then he simulated these galaxies at high redshift. These are Lyman alpha emitters in his simulation. And he asked, if I put these behind this, in this environment, what will I see from Earth? And you can see that because you have lots of neutral hydrogen here in the surrounding intergalactic medium, it will absorb most of these things and it will obscure them. So in highly uh, 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 neutral intergalactic medium, you will see few. In, uh, in, uh, in highly ionized neutral, uh, uh, in highly ionized uh, IGM, fewer uh, neutral uh, hydrogen, you will see a lot of them. Okay, so that's that's normal. So, there, so it turns out there is a number of ways to use these things to uh, to constrain ionization. One of them is. The luminosity function, if you see less versus more, that tells you about the intergalactic medium. There is another thing that is apparent from these three things, is the clustering. This is more clustered than this, right? Because you see, the, you see the, the stronger one. So the clustering turned out to be a very useful probe, and you will see numbers coming out of the clustering of these things. You can also look at the spectra and the line profiles. That's a bit more detailed uh, thing I'll skip here. Uh, okay, and this is how they look like, these things. Uh, they, they, they are not very impressive, but actually these are a very high redshift. This is incredibly impressive. If you are, uh, I'm not an observer myself, uh, although I'm talking about observations, but if you look at these things. So what you see here is, is, uh, is basically, um, uh, this is a spectrum as a function of, uh, this is a wavelength as a function of space, right? So that's in, in, on the sky, this direction, and this direction is the, is the wave number. And you can see this blob here is the galaxy, right? Uh, so if you collapse this, you will get this. And you can see the emission. This is the Lyman alpha, right? It's very noisy. It's very noisy, but, but I think by eye even you can immediately say that there is something there. So these are these, these, uh, these guys. And uh, we learned a lot from them. So they started from 5.7, and then we went higher and higher. One of the surprising things, if you look at the luminosity function, that it's kind of, it doesn't evolve much between 3 and 5. There is another line here, which is the cyan. Between redshift 3 and, and, and almost 6, it doesn't evolve so much. 
but suddenly at redshift 6.6, .6, it evolves. It becomes fainter. So again, this indicates something happens between 6 and 6.6, .6, right? The, the universe becomes a bit more neutral. And here is, oops. And here, it, how it looks like in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, kind of likelihood and, and, and where it happens. These, these are the parameters of the, of the Schechter function that they fit. Uh, this is old figure. This is not in prep anymore. This is 2012, I think. Uh, for, for, uh, yeah, this is 2012, I think. It's a very old uh, uh, slide. Uh, in, in, uh, in this paper, which is a very highly cited paper, you can turn these Lyman alpha emitters to, uh, and ask, what's the fraction that we see uh, relative to the other galaxies? So at, at low redshift, you see a small fraction. But as you go to higher and higher redshift, you, more and, and more of these Lyman alpha emitting galaxies uh, are seen. But suddenly, at redshift 6, it drops. Right? Again, this indicates the same thing. So, so this, is, this is where we are nowadays. And, uh, and uh, uh, this has, has given us a, a more constraints on reionization. And I will give you a figure at the end that sums up all of this stuff. I think I'll skip this. I don't have so much time. I'm already uh, half, half through my talk. Um, this is, uh, you can use something else. I'll show you uh, something else that you can use. Uh, these are spectra, again, of Lyman alpha. And you can, this is really how they look like when you, uh, when you kind of expand these figures. We really see this stuff. It's not lines like this. They are really resolved. Uh, from the average width of these lines, you can learn something about the temperature. I told you the, the, the Gaussian uh, shape is determined part of it by, by the temperature. So you can measure, actually, the temperature. You can use them as a thermometer uh, for the intergalactic medium temperature. This is very cool, right? Uh, there's, no, there's no way, I mean, it's measuring the temperature of a gas in the intergalactic medium is very hard, but they give us this kind of possibility. Uh, this is a simulation, of course. This is for a cold intergalactic medium versus hot intergalactic medium. And you see that, in average, you have narrower lines in the cold case versus the hot case. And you can use that to measure the temperature. And we did that uh, in 2000 in this paper. I was very involved for a number of years in these studies. And, and, uh, and, and also this paper did the same thing. And recently, Bolton et al. You can measure the temperature. So this is the temperature of the intergalactic medium as a function of redshift. And uh, initially, we used to see this, this rise in temperature and then sudden jump, uh, the sudden drop. Now people don't see the, this drop. They see a mild drop, not a very sudden drop. But anyways, this indicates the transition from helium-1 to helium-2. This is when quasar dominate, start forming, and then they ionize helium completely. Remember, helium has two electrons. One electron is, when you ionize, is roughly like hydrogen. But the other one is much deeper potential well, uh, so you, you, you have to overcome the Coulomb uh, uh, attraction. And, uh, and for that, you need uh, 54 electron volts. That's, that's not UV already. That's, that's X-ray. Uh, so quasars give you that. So you can ionize those. And we see this, this signature of helium getting ionized at lower redshifts. This is really the last phase transition, the big phase transition. Uh, uh, but then what we did, we used the temperature a little bit above this at redshift 4 to extrapolate back in time and say, ask when the universe was really ionized. And from this, it's an old study. I don't want to make too much of it. From these extrapolations, you get to redshift 9, roughly. This is also by Bolton et al. It's a newer study, and they don't start from redshift 4. They start from redshift 7. Again, you see something similar, that the universe ionizes by redshift 9 which is consistent with, with, the, with the kind of picture that's coming from Planck nowadays. I'll skip this. So I'll mention a few words about this. Uh, this is the, again, these are galaxies now. We have also, there has been this very big, big breakthrough in high redshift galaxies, not through Lyman Alpha, but through the, this technique of dropouts. Uh, I, I think the record now is about there was a claim of redshift 10 recently, but that is kind of questionable. But at least redshift 9, we see galaxies at redshift 9. It's, it's amazing that we go so, so deep. 
And the idea is basically very simple. Uh, a galaxy will, will emit in Lyman alpha, and it has this you know, certain, certain SED, spectral energy distribution. So if you have the filters, uh, a number of filters in terms of, so it's like a Poolsman spectroscopy. If you have a filter that, uh, that is centered where the galaxy emits the most, and have other filters at different f frequencies, then you should see that where it centers, it, that's the redshift, and where it's not, you see it disappearing. So the, actually, the appearance in the filter tells you where the redshift roughly. That's called redshift, uh, 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 photometric redshift type of thing. Anyways, so these are a number of galaxies that you see. These are filters in astronomy. They have the various names. It, it doesn't matter. But you see a galaxy here that appears in certain places and just disappears completely in other places. And from this, we can deduce uh, its redshift. Uh, this has been possible because, because of HST. HST made this possible, especially the refurbation, the, the, the correction of the mirrors. I mean, you are too young, but, but uh, the, mirror, the initial mirrors of, of HST were a disaster. And, <laughs> and uh, so they had to go and, and fix them. And since they fixed them, it became a completely new game. They put new, uh, new uh, uh, imaging uh, filters, etc. It's called WFPIC3, this, this, uh, this, uh, this camera. And, uh, and it kind of, within, within a few months, everything changed. And we started seeing these very high redshift things. Uh, let me, uh, uh, and now we see a lot of them. I will, not, uh, I will not go into these details. Again, I don't have so much time. Uh, uh, this is from a recent uh, work by Robertson et al., where people asked the following. If I take these galaxies and assume that the following assumptions. Now we have lots of these galaxies, and we can construct some, uh, some luminosity function of these galaxies, and et cetera, et cetera. If I assume, first of all, that, that their ionization is consistent with a very steep slope. In other words, what I see, I can translate. I see in Lyman alpha, remember. What I see, I can translate to ionizing radiation. So this translation from the UV, from the Lyman alpha to the UV, that ionizes uh, is given by the luminosity function, right? Uh, or the spectral density function. And, and that I kind of, I assume I know. And it has the slope of minus two, which is the limit that is allowed physically, right? So that's one thing. So you assume something about their spectra. The other thing you assume that out of these photons that they produce UV photons, ionizing photons, 20% escape the galaxy. This is also very uncertain. In, lo in the local universe, very low redshift universe, you can get 1% of these, of these photons escaping. In other places, you get 20. In other, so this number, which is called escape fraction, is all over the place. And there's also a debate about what it really means. But anyways, you assume some number, and you assume that this luminosity function that you assumed, you see normally the, the strongest galaxies, but, but uh, there is, so you assume that you know how the luminosity function behaves at the faint side, where you don't see stuff. And not only assume that, you assume it to be correct down to this magnitude of minus 13. This is incredibly faint. Right? So there is lots of assumptions. If you assume all of that stuff, what this figure says, here it is, that if you calculate the Thomson optical depth, this is the Planck result. You, the, the, these galaxies are consistent with Planck. This is all what it says. So, in other words, if all of these assumptions are correct, the galaxies we see in with HST are enough to ionize the universe. These are pop three, pop two galaxies. These are normal galaxies, right? Again, there's lots of assumptions, and probably all of them are wrong. But yeah. People do as much as they can. Of course, we need more evidence, but it might be, be bright. If you see here also the W map result, which was higher, you see that in the W map case, these things would not work. In other words, if the optical depth for reionization was higher from the CMB, we would have needed something else, not normal galaxies. Okay, maybe population three, maybe quasars, maybe other things. Okay, but I, I think this is astonishing that we are here. So, so if this is correct, so I'll give you a puzzle now. If this is correct, that implies that reionization is very rapid. It happened at redshift six, almost six, between seven and six, it's done. That's it. Aha, uh -huh. 
Now let's go to another kind of piece of evidence. This is a very messy figure, but uh, I'll try to explain to you what, what we see. So what people do, they take lime and alpha forest again, and from it you can deduce the, the, the opacity of the intergalactic medium, right? Because all of it comes into account, which depends on how many ionized hydrogen you have. So you do the kind of the balance, and you can get the following. At these low redshifts where you measure stuff, you can get the number of ionizing photons per baryon. How many photons per baryon, ionizing photons per baryon, you will have? If you have half a photon per baryon, it means that at most you can ionize half the universe, right? Half, you know, half of the... If you have 100 ionizing photons per baryon, it means that you have so many ionizing photons that you will certainly ionize the universe. Okay? So these guys did the study. It's this number here. And at redshift 6 is barely one from these Lyman alpha systems. Maybe if you push it a little bit, it becomes two. So you have two ionizing photons per baryon. Two for ionizing photons per baryon, it means the ionization process has to be so efficient that you use all the ionizing photons to ionize the universe. None of them escapes and do anything else. Now, if you remember structure formation and, and, and press sector, the, the number of, of uh, halos increases like mad with redshift, right? Uh, so, if this is correct, it means actually that the ionization process is very, very drawn, uh, drawn out, right? Because we don't see, I mean, if it's ionizing at redshift 6 completely, then this should jump here to, to about 10 or 20 or 100 ionizing photons per baryon. We don't see that. So it must be a very gradual process from this data. So this suggests it's a slow ionization. This suggests it's a rapid ionization. Yeah, God knows what's the answer. But it's kind of interesting period. I mean, you want these uncertainties. Otherwise, it's not interesting. Okay, so this is again the, the same story. Now, I'll, I'll summarize the, the data with this. I actually spent too much time on these things. Um, this is a very recent paper, it's, it's still in astro ph where uh, these guys, Greg and Messinger, Messinger has, has, has this machinery that does uh, maximum likelihood, the MCMC, a Monte Carlo Markov chain type of maximum likelihood. And uh, he put everything together with his uh, student, Greg, and uh, and uh, so, so they, they, they deduce this history of ionization. So this is a likelihood feature. It includes all kinds of data. So this one is what was called dark pixels. I didn't talk about it. This is the pixels in the Lyman Alpha Forest that are completely dark. They're, they have no emission whatsoever. They are just basically like that. So you saw them in the spectra. This is from Lyman Alpha fraction, which is Lyman Alpha... Uh, 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 that I talked about before. This is Lyman alpha clustering, uh, emitters clustering. This is the damping wing. This is how, you know, kind of fast you go from the Lyman alpha emission down to zero. And, uh, and these two uh, kind of hashed line, one is W map, the big one, and the small one is, is Planck. Uh, and you can see that we are getting to a range where you have this type of history. The uncertainties are very big still, but things are tying up, right? It's, it's, not, it's not as uncertain as it was something like five years ago or ten years ago. Uh, of course, uh, any of these things can, can, be in, can, can turn out to be wrongly interpreted, and, and this will be wrong, yeah? But, so we have to be careful with these things. But this is the status, okay? Questions? Yes, please. Come again. Why this is too big? The dark pixels is this one. Uh, this one is this. This is uh, this damping wing. This is this high redshift quasar that you saw, how fast it is. Yeah, yeah, it's very little, and it's very specific quasar, and it has its properties. It's not clear. I mean, there's lots of argument, uh, and some people like Andre Messinger 
uh, kind of, uh, uh, he argues for that this is really the intergalactic medium. Some people think, no, 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 these are the intrinsic properties of the Lyman alpha emitters themselves. So there's, there's this un uncertainty, but yeah. Okay. This is where we are, and now I'll spend the rest of these two, this, this talk and tomorrow on the future, which is this new probe that people have been uh, thinking about uh, uh, for a long time, but now it's becoming, uh, uh, becoming uh, you know, uh, almost available. It's not available completely, but, but people are working very hard on it. It's very exciting stuff, uh, and uh, I'll talk about it. The, I'm involved in LOFAR, which is one of the instruments that are looking at this uh, radiation from high redshifts, uh, but there is the future, which is SKA, the Americans are building something. Uh, SKA is the square kilometer array, which is a huge uh, thing that will uh, also look at these things. And uh, the Americans are building uh, uh, HERA, which is, again, another telescope that looks at these things in radio, in 21 centimeter. So uh, how many of you learned something about 21 centimeter emission before coming here? Ah, OK, so you, 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 know, you know more than I expected. OK, very good. So, but I bet you didn't know the history. So I like history, so I think it's, it's quite nice. So I'll tell you a bit of, of the history of this. So this is one of these uh, wonderful stories. Uh, so, so this line is, is a forbidden line. Uh, you will see in a, in, a, in a minute. And in astronomy, the story goes like this. In the Netherlands, there was this guy called Jan Oort. If you haven't heard of Jan Oort, you should have. Uh, he's famous not only from the Oort clouds, he's famous for many, many uh, things. Uh, he was uh, as a professor at Leiden during World War II. These are the years. And uh, then it was German occupation, and scientists were not allowed to go to universities, so they would kind of gather in small places, in houses, in, in cellars, and stuff like this. And uh, there was this student there who looked bright, uh, but his, his, his advisor was in Utrecht, and he was in jail, I think, or something like this. He was kind of uh, more restricted, so he couldn't supervise him. So Jan Oort suggested to this guy, it's called Hink van der Hulst, to look at these forbidden lines if they are interesting for astronomy. And uh, uh, so, Jan, so van der Hulst went there and calculated. This is under a war, right? A horrible war that was going on, but he still, these people could focus and do stuff. Uh, and he showed that it is very, very interesting for astronomy. So this was written in 1945, and it was published in a, a local magazine in the Netherlands. Nobody has see, seen it, but somehow word got out that the Dutch have kind of predicted this, and then they became a, 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 a kind of a competition. Who would see it first from our galaxy? And there were two groups working on it, one in Harvard by Ewen and, and Brussels, and the other one is Oort himself. And the Dutch were ahead of the rest. So what Oort did at the time, he took two uh, German uh, radar batteries after the war. They have done their damage. Now, now they can be used in a good way. And made a telescope out of them. And uh, tried to, uh, to look at it. Unfortunately for him, there was a fire in the, in, the, in the instruments, and that set them back a number, a couple of years, which made, the, which made the, the Harvard group beat them to the detection. But it was, it was these days, in these days, people were much more gentlemanly than now, and the Harvard group waited with the publication until the Dutch found the line themselves. Uh, I think also to confirm what they have seen, but also in terms of courtesy to, to Ort and, and his group, and if you look at, at when this was published, it's Nature 1951, 168356, and this is 1951, 168357. So there were two pages, one after the other, published one after the other. So this was nice. Uh, but, uh, but at the time, not much was known about this, this thing. So, so the, there was an initial calculation. It was very approximate. And... Um, and then you would ask, what are the excitation mechanisms? How you kind of excite these things to, to radiate? I'll, I'll show you that in a second. And then again, Ort talked to a physicist who was, I think, in Amsterdam. Wout, this is a Dutch name. You should pronounce it Wouthausen. I didn't know this before going to the Netherlands. But this is, this is the, you know. He, he proposed a, a mechanism for, 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 for excitation. And I'll show you his paper. 
Oh, I can do this, right? Uh, oh, 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 oh. This is the paper of Wauthausen. This is the paper, all of it. It's this marked by red. Five paragraphs. And he has an effect after him. All what he says is that there is a mechanism of excitation by Lyman alpha. That's all what he says in this. No calculation, nothing, just blah, blah. Uh, but yeah, you have to be first and lucky and, uh, and do something important. Actually, the real kind of paper in this field is by, by, by Field himself. <laughs> uh, and these are a number of papers, 1958. They are wonderful papers. So I, if you, uh, they are kind of full of physics. He uses Einstein population uh, kind of... Uh, uh, Einstein A, B, and therefore uh, stimulated emission and absorption and all of that stuff to calculate all of these effects. And uh, so this is really what sets up the, the field. Um, but nothing was much done by this in terms of high redshift and cosmology. This became a very active field for galaxies. That's where radio galaxies started. People started looking at radio galaxies. Uh, at some stage, it became important when Zeldovich has proposed his, uh, his uh, structure formation uh, because you know now we, we work with CDM. CDM is a, a bottom-up uh, type of, uh, so you form things small and then go big, uh, the hierarchical thing, right? Whereas Zeldovich had a, a top-down model, which starts with the pancakes, Zeldovich pancakes. These are the first things that collapse, and then smaller and smaller things uh, do collapse. Now, nowadays, we know that was wrong. That is not the way it goes. It goes the other way around. But, uh, but Zeldovich has proposed this model. If his model was correct, you can use each one hydrogen to probe these Zeldovich pancakes. Uh, so people looked at this and that didn't yield much, especially after CDM was kind of confirmed as, a, as, a, as, as, a, as, a, as the paradigm. This is back in the 80s. Uh, the, the only person that was pushing this as a probe, each one as a probe of high redshift stuff is Martin Rees. And he would have a paper every decade almost with one of his students or one of his collaborators uh, starting with, uh, so there is a, a paper before this uh, with uh, Hogan, Greg Hogan and Rees. So there's a Hogan and Rees, something like a decade before this, 82, 83, something like that. And then Scott and Rees pointed out that this is possible. Everybody ignored them until this paper came. So this paper is really the beginning of this field in terms of the theory. Uh, it's by Piero Madao. Uh, he was in Cambridge at the time, and, and Avery Mikesen were in Cambridge at the time, and Martin somehow convinced them that, oh, it's interesting to look at this, and they came up with a really kind of interesting paper that said, we can do this. Immediately after this, after a couple of years, there was a paper by observers <laughs> confirming that we can do it from the observational side. So this is the history of this, of this line, and, uh, and these two set up in motion many of these kinds of projects that are now happening on radio telescopes. So that's, yeah, so radio telescopes are going through a golden era now. Uh, they haven't done that for a long time. Uh, kind of stagnated for a while, but now they are really exciting. Uh, let me go back. Yeah, okay. Let's talk about physics a little bit and, uh, and the basic physics, and tomorrow I'll, I'll, I'll continue with, with this. Uh, at what time I finish? At uh, four? Five, uh, five, sorry, four, <laughs> five. So what is the 21 centimeter? It's a spin-spin interaction and, um, uh, between the electron and the proton. It's a, forbidden, it's a, it's a hyperfine transition. Uh, and you have two states in this. Either the two spins of the electron and the proton in the hydrogen, in neutral hydrogen, are anti-parallel. In this case, the total spin is zero, because one up and one down. Therefore, S is zero. It's a singlet state. And that's important. The other option is that the two spins are parallel. Then the sum is one, and then you will have a triplet. Again, this is very important. So you'll see in a second why. Uh, uh, and, and then you, have, you know, so you go from here to here. Uh, this is the ground state. This is the parallel spin is the, is the excited state, and this emission gives you a radiation at 21 centimeter. If this if this fluid is in equilibrium with its surrounding, it's in thermal bath or something like this, you can describe the, popu the, 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 the density of states at the excited uh, case versus in the ground case by this Boltzmann factor, right? The three comes from the statistical weight of triplet versus singlet, three to one. Uh, this T star is KT, basically, the energy of the transition. We know that. It's 21 centimeters. This is number we know very well, right? It's measured to this. 
And this is a shorthand for the ambient temperature. That's called the spin temperature. That's in, uh, so in this field, the spin temperature means the, the ratio between the excited and, and, uh, and uh, 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 ground states. Okay? So that's the shorthand. Not always you get equilibrium. But still, you translate from, from the, you know, you still use the term of spin, spin temperature. Uh, this temperature of the line itself that corresponds to 21 centimeter is very tiny. It's five microelectron volt. It's not, it's not much. It's actually, it's about six actually. And the lifetime, it's a forbidden state situation. So the lifetime of this transition is about 10 million years. It's very, very, very long. But we have lots of hydrogen in the universe. Therefore, it happens much more often. It's a very... And the question is how you pump the line. If you have go, something goes from here to here, how you excite it again to go here? Uh, so there's a bit of physics now involved that I have to explain. There are uh, three mechanisms that can do this. Excite. One of them is the CMB itself. The CMB, if you remember, is a Planckian. Planckians have this very, very, very long tail at low energies. Right? There's the Wien kind of tail, which is exponential. It cuts off, but at low energies, the uh, Taylor something, I forget the name, uh, uh, side, uh, then uh, you, uh, you, get, you, get, uh, you get a very, very long tail. So if you have photons that, are, uh, that have uh, uh, the energy of, of this transition, they will excite the state. Right? So that's one mechanism. It's very important. This stuff will come back in how we calculate these things. The second mechanism is this uh, Wauthausen field uh, effect. For good reason, field is, enjoy is, is there as well. I'll show it to you here. This is, the, this is the effect. If you have Lyman alpha photons, what Lyman alpha photons do, they excite your hydrogen atom from the ground state to the Lyman alpha state. But this is a very short-lived state. They kind of decays back immediately to the, to the ground state. But when it decays back immediately to the ground state, it has to decide, am I in this state or in this state? Which one wins? This. Because it has a statistical weight three times higher than the other one. Just more, more states. So they, they, will be, they will preferentially go to here. Right? And this way you have excited. So if you have a photon that was here, a system that was here, have a Lyman alpha photon getting things up there and when we go down, it's more likely, three times more likely to come back to this one rather than this one. Right? That's why the triplet is important. Okay. And the third mechanism is uh, collisions. If you have things collide, they can excite as well. Okay? And now Field in his uh, famous paper in 1958 asked, what is the relationship between the spin temperature and the CMB temperature, the kinetic temperature, and Lyman alpha temperature. Turns out that one approximation he made, and it's valid almost always, uh, you can show that, is that the Lyman alpha photons uh, are, have the same kind of, they induce the same temperature as the kinetic temperature, the gas temperature around it. So basically, you have a competition between the kinetic temperature, the gas temperature, and the CMB temperature. And you have these coupling kind of constants. If these coupling constants dominate, then your spin temperature will be like the gas temperature. If your coupling constants do not dominate, the, spin the CMB will win, and your spin temperature will be like the CMB. This is, again, important for the following reason. If your photons from this emitted 21 centimeter photons have the same temperature as the CMB, you will not see them. It's like looking at a red dot on a red background. You just cannot distinguish them from the CMB because they have the same temperature. Therefore, in order to see this effect, we have, it has to decouple from the CMB. These temperatures have to be different than the CMB. And luckily, the gas temperature in the universe is different than the, gas temperature, than the CMB temperature. The CMB temperature, for instance, now is 2.73 Kelvin. The gas temperature is about 10 to the 4. You remember this uh, cooling curve that I showed yesterday? Cooling curves decide this. It's about 10 to the 4. 
almost any kind of system, except if it's in the, inside the sun or something, but the diffuse thing, intergalactic medium, and it's, the, it's 10 to the 4. Okay? Again, all of this because of the laminar. So it's a competition between these two temperatures. And, uh, okay, so I explained, uh, this is the collisional coupling, which I kind of uh, mentioned, and this is what, what collides with what. Uh, so, okay, so from all of this, you can make this calculation. It's a linear calculation. Still, you have to go through some details. And uh, what we measure in radio telescopes, it's called the brightness temperature. It's a shorthand for the intensity. It's basically the number of photons that you measure, okay? Uh, and if you have a black body, the brightness temperature is the temperature. But if it's not a black body, it's different, okay? So that's the... Now, the, the, the temperature, which means the intensity, the number of photons that get to your telescope from the, so the C, this is the CMB, and it travels through some cloud, and this cloud has certain spin temperature, right? Certain temperature that is associated, associated with, this, uh, with this transition. Some of this, uh, of this CMB will be absorbed, right? This is the absorption uh, uh, probability, and some of, the, of it will be transmitted. This is the transmission probability. This is what you saw in the previous lecture as the probability for not scattering, right? So that's, that's that. It's called trans transmit, uh, 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 transmission probability. And, but we don't measure really this. As I said, you don't measure the temperature itself. You measure the temperature difference between these photons and the CMB, because that's you would differentiate. If they are the same, you don't see the difference. So you have to do this difference to see stuff. And, and this is the way it, you know, if you rewrite this in this way, this is what you get. And then you can expand this. You know what it is. It's this, uh, this you know, optical depth for this transition. This is, uh, uh, this is E10. This comes from Einstein A and B and all of that stuff. There's lots of details. I will not go into this. But look at Field's paper. It's quite nice. I, I, it's one of the nicest paper I've seen in astronomy. It has lots of physical insights. Uh, and then you go through this calculation. It's a long calculation. It's the, last, it's the end of the day, so I will not go through it. But at the end, you will get that the optical depth is proportional to the density, 1 plus delta. With the, with the, this is a term that has to do with redshift distortions, and this term has to do with the neutral fraction, and this is the spin temperature. And there is some redshift dependence. If you put all of this together, you get to this equation which is the basic equation we work with. It looks messy, but it's really very rich. So uh, let me explain this and stop here, I hope, uh, maybe another one after this, just to give you a, a so. so if you calculate this, this is done first by Field, but later by Madau, Mike and Ries, and other people later, you get to this uh, formula. First of all, delta Tb, it, it's equal 28 millikelvin. This sets the scale. We are looking at things in terms of temperature, of orders of tens, few tens of millikelvin, if not 10 millikelvin. Okay? It's very cold. At these very low frequencies, that's, that's hard to measure. Then it's proportional to 1 plus delta. That makes sense. The more density you have, the more emission you will have, right? That also makes sense. This naive-looking thing, XH1, that's the neutral fraction. This is how much, what's the fraction of, of hydrogen that is in that neutral state. If this is zero, there's, it means all hydrogen is ionized, you shouldn't see this effect at all because there is nothing to emit. If it's one, which means everything is neutral, you should see the maximum of it. So this also makes sense. This is a more complicated one, and I'll spend some time on this. This, is, this has to do with the dif difference between the CMB and the spin temperature. Again, if the spin temperature is equal to the CMB, you see nothing. Okay? So that's, that's this effect. And all of these are kind of... Uh, there's another term here which I ignored, but it should be there. It's this one. It's exactly this one. I forgot to copy, this is, uh, to, to copy it here. So, and these are just constant, basically, and redshift evolution. Okay? So this is the... And if you measure at high redshifts, for instance, you will have that the universe is neutral. So this will be one. Uh, and, and you will have that the, in certain redshifts that the spin temperature is much higher than the CMB. If the spin temperature is much higher than the CMB, this term is one. 
You can neglect the CMB and it becomes TS over TS. Then all what you measure is one plus delta. That's cosmology. That's actually much better than the CMB if, if you get it right. Because the CMB is one slice in redshift. This can be many, many slices in redshift. Right? If we can measure it. But, yeah. So from this and this and this thing that I forgot, which is the redshift distortions, you learn about cosmology. From this and this, you learn about the messy physics of ionization. Ionization bubbles, sources, etc. So this is a very rich phenomena. At low redshift, you had learn mostly about this. At high redshift, you learn mostly about this. At higher redshift, you learn mostly about this term alone. And that's I will I will explain uh, to you. Uh, I do this right, and I finish here. I think I, I started a few minutes late. I don't want to get stuck on this next time. So what does this show? This, is, uh, this, uh, this figure is, is, has lots of uh, insights. And uh, the first to point out this is, is Loeb and Zaldariaga, and then uh, Pritchard and Loeb, and then we have done some stuff on it. Now, let's look at the two things that decide the spin temperature. I told you the spin temperature is a, a competition between the CMB temperature and the gas temperature. Now, if you look at the CMB after decoupling, we know what is the CMB, CMB temperature. And it drops like 1 plus Z, right? So this is this blue thing. So this is the temperature as a function of redshift, right? We know it. And it doesn't change. This is kind of. But what happens to the gas? If you think about it, the gas, the initial impression is that the gas after decoupling should cool adiabatically, right? No, that doesn't happen immediately. Because you still have, even after decoupling, a little bit of ionized stuff. And the universe is dense enough so that Compton scattering is still efficient. So Compton scattering keeps the gas at the same temperature as the CMB. CMB photons, Compton scatter on the gas, electrons, and they keep it at the same temperature. It doesn't drop immediately after the decoupling at redshift 1100. This actually waits until about redshift 200. Then the universe becomes cold enough and dilute enough because of the expansion that this process is not very efficient anymore. Then the gas is free. If the gas is free, it cools down. Now, for, you can make this calculation, and this is a homework if you want. Ask yourself, how an adiabatic gas, a gas, a novel gas, would cool adiabatically in an expanding universe? You can show that it goes like 1 plus z squared. It cools very efficiently, much more efficiently than the photons, than the CMB. Right? So the gas drops. This is the green stuff. It drops very fast. But then at low redshift, when the first objects start forming, they start heating up the gas again, and then the gas goes up until 10 to the 4 that we see now. But gas can cool, cool, get cold very, very quickly. OK. So these are the two things. Now, what does the spin temperature do? The, spin, the poor spin temperature is torn about part. You know, some, the gas wants it, and the CMB wants it. And the question, which one wins? At high redshift, they are both the same. So the, the spin temperature has easy life. It's the same temperature as the rest. But when we go to lower redshifts, from a little bit lower than 200, what happens is that you still have, because the universe is still dense relatively, you have a lot of collisions. Collisions couple the spin temperature to the gas. Although the gas become colder than the CMB, the spin temperature sticks to the gas because of these collisions. So here, this is how I'm talking about redshift 100. Here, the spin temperature sticks to the gas and becomes colder than the CMB. But after a while, this, the, the universe keeps expanding, and this, this collisional thing stops being so efficient. Then the CMB veers toward the gas. Uh, the, sorry, the spin temperature veers, veers toward the CMB again. So it goes from the gas to the CMB. 
Now, what happens later, there are two options, but most people think the option is this dashed line. You start forming new, uh, new galaxies, the first galaxies, the first objects. Then they start emitting Lyman alpha and X-rays. What those do? They really, again, couple the, CMB, the spin temperature back to the gas. They pull it from the CMB back to them. So this goes like this. And then here, reionization happens, which means the gas gets heated to 10 to the 4, and then everything goes up. Right? So now, if you go back to this equation and forget about the rest. At high, very high redshift, this is, this is uh, delta is very small. Therefore, this is almost 1. Nothing is ionized. And these are just cosmological numbers, nothing much. This is the, and, and this is 1. Nothing is ionized. So this is the important bit. First, you remember, the spin temperature is, gets coupled to the gas. And it goes down. It goes negative. Right? So the spin temperature is smaller than the CMB. So this term becomes negative over the spin temperature. OK? Then after a while, the spin temperature goes to the CMB. Then this becomes 0 because the spin temperature equals to the CMB at some stage. Now later, oops, again this goes down, which means you again have another negative period. And then at the end, this becomes so hot, hotter than the CMB that the CMB is ignored. And this becomes like 1. Now there is asymmetry between positive and negative here. If the spin, tem oops, sorry. If the spin temperature is much larger than CMB, this term can be maximum 1. Ts over Ts. That's 1. However, if the spin, oops, if the spin temperature is much smaller than the CMB, this term can be minus 1,000. No one stops it from being minus 1,000. So you can see it in absorption much, much stronger than you see it in emission. That's the difference between positive and negative. OK? And people have kind of worked out this. This is a paper by Pritchard and Loeb that showed this, this change in the brightness. At very high redshift, this is, you see this absorption. That's called the Dark Ages absorption. Then you go back to zero, and then you have another absorption. That's in the cosmic dawn, when the first object starts forming. And then again, it goes back to zero, but then it jumps over because of reionization happening. And you can see this. Current instruments focus on this, this tiny thing. This is where we are. And this re refers to redshift about 10. This is what we are trying to observe. Future instruments like SKA hope to see this, which would be very nice. This is hopeless from the ground, absolutely hopeless, because of the atmosphere. You better go to the moon to do this. And some people are thinking about the moon. Actually, the best place in the solar system is Mars. You know, go to Mars. And the best place ever, go out of the galaxy. Then you can, you can see that. But uh, so. Anyways, so this is for dreamers. People dream to do this. Maybe, uh, maybe well, I, I will not see it in my lifetime, at least in my career. But you maybe see it, uh, that it's done from the moon. But this is really exciting for the future. We are now focusing on this. And I'll stop here. Thank you for your patience.